was in the castle. In the castle. There's a big castle in, in the castle. castle. Yes. Oh, cool. Yeah, well, my dad work. was in the army, and so um, he got stationed there from 1972 to 75. So I was a junior and a senior in high school. And um, back then we had military posts. There was one um, for where all the houses were, another one where all of the different offices and, and stuff, and another one where they had like the VX and the commissary and, and all that kind of stuff. But I, I, we had our prom and graduation in the castle. And my graduating class was 144. And this past um, okay. August, or was it September? September. September. One of the guys in my class um, sponsored a 50-year reunion. For the 74 class? For the 73. Oh, 73. Yeah, 73. I graduated in 73. <coughs> and it was in Cleveland, because that's where he lived. So we went to it, had a ball. Mm -hmm. And of the 144 people, I think 30 showed up mm -hmm. from our, our from class. From that class. Yeah. But there were cool. others from other classes yeah. and, and stuff. So. But it was a really the cool. cool thing is, is they're talking of having the 75 reunion in Heidelberg. Oh, that would be cool. Well, I'll be, I'm 75. Uh -huh. So I'm not going to mine in Dallas. <laughs> I'm just telling you You're right going. Now. You're, you're going out. So I'm celebrating. I wouldn't Heidelberg. either. Yeah, I think it's. Well, my. Um, you know, been there? I haven't. No. I went to Heidelberg. When my brother-in-law was career army. Mm -hmm. Poor thing. And. Um, he was stationed at Frankfurt, which wasn't too, too far. No. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, uh, and my nephew graduated from high school there. But, um, so we went to Heidelberg, and it is quite a lovely mm -hmm. city. My I've, mom and I've dad. stood on that very bridge yeah. looking uh -huh. at it. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> my mom so and dad could... were in Ilsheim. 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 Well, I happen to know you can make a lot of money with that cup. <laughs> you oh, could really? auction it off, baby. <laughs> oh, silent auction. For a donation. Oh, <laughs> I'll, I'll consider that. Check, think check, about it. Check eBay. See how much that costs. <laughs> oh, yeah. You think it's... Uh, well, <clears throat> <Good point. laughs> the, what has always made me mad about these cups is that for a long time here, they would have the Dallas Cup. And it was like, this is not Dallas. Yeah, right. We yeah. do not want the Dallas Cup. But mm -hmm. I think now they have a Fort Worth Cup. Okay. Yes. And so. Do we have a Fort Worth Cup? We don't. We, we, have a, we have a Texas, but we don't have an actual city. And then they, they also make them, the little squattier ones uh -huh. are called yeah. You Are Here. Uh -huh. So I don't know what the difference is. But okay. like we got them from China, from uh, in Beijing, you know, and yeah. all the yeah. So I'm not sure how they differentiate. I've never seen those at Starbucks. Who gets? You've never <laughs> seen them? Yeah. yeah. They're, oh, they're at all at Starbucks. <clears throat> I mean, really, they're at a lot of them. And um, oh, the airport, they're at yeah, the yeah, airport at Starbucks. Yeah. I got yeah. one from Paris. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, when I was in Paris. There you go. Yeah. Which That's I it. always seem to wind up in Paris, and I hate Paris. Really? <laughs> wow. Well, I love the nightlife, yeah. but I don't like... The people in the daytime, the pushing and the shoving mm -hmm. and all that. That's my problem with Paris. Mm -hmm. I'll stay up all night in Paris because it's wonderful. But I'll sleep when I go to Paris. Anytime I go overseas, my layovers are always in Paris. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, always. <laughs> well, we, when we went to see my sister when she was living in England, Terry and I, went. we had not been to France. So we flew to Paris for just a long weekend. And you know it's like that long. I wanted to ride the channel. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it was cool. cheaper to fly on British really? Airways. <laughs> huh. So we did it. And um, when I got off, this is what I always remember. I got off, and you know you have to go through customs. They're checking your passport, and they wanted to know my occupation. And I said I was a minister. And he said, "You are." A minute, we'll see. He's thinking minister, oh, like, like minister political. Of education. political. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. finally, it dawned because he was so pleased, and I thought, why would he be so excited about that? And so finally, I said, <laughs> priest. And he said, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. It was like, you shot just, him down. You just lost status. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No good. Okay. Well, um, 
Today in worship, we are talking about still hospitality, and um, the the scripture is um, probably one of the two best known scriptures uh, parables that Jesus told is the Good Samaritan, mm -hmm. and so. Um, that story, I don't know about you, but if you've gone to church much in your life, you've probably heard many sermons on this story and, or Bible studies or whatever. And so I wanted us to talk about, um, there are many ways to interpret it. It has been interpreted many ways. So I want you to tell me how you've always thought of that story. What, if, what have you thought about that story? Helping somebody that was on the side of the road. That you should be a helper? Yeah. Okay. What did you think about why the two, first the Levite and the priest didn't help? What did you think about the explanation for why they didn't <clears> stop <throat> and help? Because they would be the usual suspects, right? That would stop, You would one would think. But why did they not stop? They were prejudiced. Well, they be. didn't want to get involved. Could I mean, be. Mm -hmm. Could be. I, there's not a, I mean, I don't have the right answer, but I think all those are possible. Um, what else? What What else could be a reason that they didn't? You know, I've, I've heard, one of the things I've heard, which I'm not sure this is true, is that the priest could have thought that um, if he touched, you know, a sick person or something, yeah, he, he would be, un be unclean and he would have to go through a cleansing ritual, you know, that... I guess that's a possibility. Um, what else about that story? It's a real good uh, story like children. They all look fun to tell children. One of the things I'll tell you that um, you get a little preview of the sermon is that good is nowhere in the story when Jesus tells it. He doesn't say the good Samaritan. That's been added. The people who interpreted the Bibles, I mean, you know, the Hebrew and stuff years ago, years ago, somebody added the good Samaritan, because he sounds like the good person, which in that case he is. But um, anybody else, what's something you've thought about that story before? Or have you ever thought about that story? <laughs> he couldn't, he may not want to be bothered, thought if he helped him, he'd have to take care of him, okay. take him home. Yeah, okay. Um, I mean, yeah. I'd say to the hospital, but they didn't have hospitals back then. But right. Somewhere that he would be having to take care of. Them. It would get, he would, it would become a bigger thing to have yeah. to, yeah. That's another okay. way to look at it. Yeah, that I was, is. I was okay. thinking he would, he, along with, I didn't want to get involved, he's in a hurry going somewhere. Mm -hmm. I don't have time to stop him. Don't have time to stop and deal with yeah. this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have you ever thought maybe he was afraid? I was going to say fear. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fear that um, that one thing he could have been afraid that whoever jumped him is behind the next, you know, turn in the road waiting for him and would also do the same to him. Well, like you always hear on the news, the Good Samaritan stopped to help uh -huh. the person on the side of the road and uh -huh. they got killed. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And you're like, no, I don't want to be that. Well, and we've heard those true stories. Yeah. You know, that person yeah. stops and they're <laughs> helping change a tire and they're and they're hit by a car or something. Yeah, we've heard that. Uh, and they use that term. You're exactly right. So it's not just a term that church people know. It's a church term that other people know too, because they know what that means when you say a good Samaritan did it, which is interesting. Um, so Barbara Brown Taylor says who I like very much. She says, uh, but don't tell anybody before church, <laughs> she says it would be more likely like a Muslim who is in Hamas stopping to help. That's how surprised the people would have been to mm -hmm. hear this story and Jesus say a Samaritan stop. They were bitter enemies and um, it wasn't like oh, this is a good guy, one of us, and he's the one that stops and helps. It, the people in the crowd, they would have thought, eh, priest Levi, yeah, you know, they're, that doesn't surprise me. But when they heard that, they would have been shocked that that's the person that helped. And, but one of the interpretations, um, John Claypool, one of my favorite uh, preachers, and it's Liz likes him, 
and um, he um, was actually a pastor at Broadway many, 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 many years ago. He became an Episcopalian priest and um, probably one of the best preachers I've ever heard in my life still. And he said one of the things he thought about the story was perhaps the man that, that helped was helping out of his own that he also knew pain and hurt and, mm. and suffering. And so he was helping out of the depth of his compassion because of his own woundedness. And so uh, Henry Nowen, who is a very well-known uh, writer, uh, was a pre Catholic priest, and he had wrote a book called The Wounded Healer. And he says that we help others out of our own woundedness, that that's the place to come. Like, I have compassion for you because I too know what, what it's like. And so out of my own woundedness, I can feel compassion for you. And um, so let's talk about that just a little bit. What, what do you think about that? That if you've never been hurt in your life and you've never had any, and there are a few people that seem to make it through like that, um, if, if you've never experienced uh, loss, um, can you feel for other people? Can you reach out to other people, do you think? Or um, think about your own experience of being helped and helping others. Um, um, I don't know why this just popped into my mind, but my friend just sent me a picture of her 103-year-old aunt who is in Thailand, and her granddaughter sent a picture. They were out to dinner, and she says, it says, Grandma with the drag queens, and she's sitting in her wheelchair surrounded by all the drag queens. Really? <laughs> and she's, That's she's, cute. It's cute. This, this, uh, this was, is my friend's aunt, and she used to drive in her truck from Chicago to come down and see my friend when she was, like, in her 80s. And uh, so she's, uh, when I was thinking about living life and if you've ever been wounded, but anyway. So think about your own experience of being helped and helping. What do you think about that idea? I had thought when, I think there's a book that said when, when bad things happen yeah, to absolutely. good people, and people say, yeah. why would God let that mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. And I go, you know, I've been through a divorce, other people have too, and, and loss and grief mm -hmm. and all that. But if none of us had been through anything like that, how could people be available to help someone who is now going through, through that? Through that. And yeah, because the people, like, if you went through a divorce, the people that came to you in that and said, I've had that experience, mm -hmm. that is, you, that might be more meaningful than somebody who just said, oh, I'm so sorry. And, right. Yeah. Okay, all right, and so you've experienced that yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, somebody else. What do you think? All I can think about is that there was a, I'm not sure it was on the news, uh -huh. but it was a, a man being beaten up by a big crowd, and another man came in and stepped in and stood over him and told, him, told everybody that was beaten and leave him alone. Because he was going to, if he, they kept on, they was going to die. But he was the good Samaritan. Yes, exactly. And you know, recently, that shooting in, uh, right after Christmas, where was it, Idaho or somewhere? You know, there was a school Idaho. shooting. Idaho. Iowa. And the prin uh, principal yeah. stepped in in front of the children and was shot. And he has, he has subsequently died. And... Um, he was trying to protect the children, and he stepped in just oh, yeah. like like that. And 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 uh, his family made the comment that they weren't surprised at all that he would do that. So, okay, somebody else. Have you been helped by someone who also was wounded in the same same way? For instance, when you came out, was there somebody who had come out much earlier and said? It's going to be okay, you know, it's going to be okay. Anybody that encouraged you or um, said, you know, I've, I've done this, you can do this. 
You remember when Joel Burns made that speech and he said, uh, it's gonna get better, it'll get better, and how that just resonated across the whole LGBTQ community because that's what you need to hear when you're worried about how are people gonna react, what are they gonna think, you know, what, what am I gonna lose if I do this? Um, but what am I gonna gain? And so, anybody in that experience, were you helped by someone who was uh, maybe older or had, had done the same thing? Nobody? Well, th this isn't exactly on topic, but I was watching a segment of Joy Reid the other night, and she had one of the Moms for Liberty on there, oh, uh -huh. and they were talking about <clears throat> book bans and um, in Florida and yeah. nationwide and all. And Joy was trying to make the point that you know people need those books. Yeah, they they need to read about other people that have experienced what mm -hmm. they have or what they may consider, I guess, pornographic, just because it's different, um, a type of love or you know, it's wrong that we need those books to identify. Right, right, that some, we can, that's another way that we're helped, mm -hmm. you know, like when we're growing up and stuff, when we read those books, that's exactly right. And um, so that's, it's not uh, like a person coming to us, but it is in, in a way that they're coming to us through a book, mm -hmm. and yeah. Yeah, I think that's really true. And, you know, kids, as we all know, they're pretty smart. And, um, you know, I just think most kids are able to figure out, let me say a lot of kids are able to figure out, that's really not my problem. You know, they read a book and they read about something, whatever. That's really, you know, I, not me, but, this is me over here. So yeah, I think it's very valuable and I think parents underestimate children. Um, you know, when you have children you think, oh, they just don't know about anything. They don't know this and they probably know all about it from school and stuff and you don't know. And so we underestimate their ability to be discerning and that kind of thing. But uh, a lot of the books that they want to take out, I'm not really sure why. I mean, To Kill a Mockingbird, because it talks about racism? Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, or Anne Frank. Or Anne Frank? Yeah. I mean, who wasn't touched by that book when you read that? I mean, well, I mean, you were saying someone would be reading the book and say, that's not me, but it may be a friend of theirs. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. that would help them. Help you know, somebody they know. Yeah. Absolutely. And that book, to me, if you read that, I mean, even at a young age, you realize the atrocity that was perpetrated Everybody on should you. read that book. Everybody yeah. should read that book. What we read it growing up in school. Yeah. And Frank, I mean, yeah, I mean, it was third grade. Yeah, well, I'm just saying, <laughs> yeah. it was third grade here in Fort Worth, it was kind of required. It was yeah. one of the books, yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. and so it kind of, like you said, shocks me, of course, my opinion is damn Republicans don't have anything else to do. They can't worry about our economy or or anything like that, so they're going to... Worry about the books. They're worry about mm -hmm. the books and worry about this, you know. Well, why don't you fix our economy? Yeah. So no, we can't do that. Right. Well, like people with illnesses, you know, that uh -huh. are sick, um, that you know have cancer or have uh -huh. like for instance with my boss that has ALS uh -huh. one of the judge's sisters passed away from ALS and so she's been real helpful at being able to talk to Janet yeah. and tell her what's going on and uh -huh. I mean but so many people have reached out to her that have had experiences even David when I told him that Janet uh -huh. had ALS he, he has a friend uh, that has ALS as well and so we talk about it a lot and I, you know just having that kind of conversation, mm -hmm. you know, sort of takes some fear out of it. But also at Pupa's when Lisa and Jane were killed, you know, so many people, you know, wrapped their arms around me. Mm -hmm. um, so I've always tried to pay that back. 
Yeah, absolutely. Then you can't go back and, you know, say, do something for that same person. That's right. But you can. Pass it on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And you could just clam up and say, <coughs> I'm not going to ever talk. I mean, but you're right. But there's so many people you could help who have experienced uh, gun violence or whatever, you know, but. Yeah, I think absolutely. Yeah, we can ban books, but we can't ban assault rifles. Yeah, isn't that odd? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Those poor little children, they won't be hurt by those, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but those books. They don't get me started. They'll still be alive. <coughs> yeah. To what? They would still be alive. They would still. If the assault weapons were banned. That is exactly right. That is exactly right. That's the hard part. That's the hard part. And, um, but um, I was thinking about when. I don't know if one of you was saying about um, reading books that that help you sometimes navigate life, you know, help you know, uh, give you ideas and thoughts that help you make it through life. And um, kids, you know, often think their parents don't understand, but they might understand. But um, sometimes other voices have to be the ones that help. a good thing but I think it's very sad if kids can't read um, books that make them think about things anyway. or that were foundational for yeah, us absolutely. Are and are we are, what, are any of us have we gone crazy and you know, I mean think about the millions of people that have read Anne Frank and how touched they were by the book but they it didn't do I mean what do they think it's going to do to them that's what I don't understand small portion in there about sexuality and yeah because she yeah a, and that's what they're protesting over anything that has to do with sex well I probably told you all this before but um, at Broadway we did this we called it the sex the kids called it the sex retreat but it was for fifth and sixth graders and it was I mean we really talked about relationships and the whole nine yard nine yards and about, I mean, they might ban that, I don't know. Yeah. But anyway, um, so these parents came to me, they had a sixth grader, and they said, um, we just don't think our daughter's ready for this. She doesn't know about any of this stuff, and we just don't think she's ready to, and I'm thinking, whoa. And so, uh, so they said, you know, we don't know if we should let her go, and I said, well, I just think this is a very, safe place to talk about things if you have questions and stuff so they let her go and so the night we would do a lot of the stuff boys and girls but then um, there was at least one or two sessions where it was separated and the night that the girls met and we were talking and girls were talking about things that they were incur uh, encountering in school and all that and this girl said well I get invited to these parties and she said they're doing things that I don't really want to do, but, you know, they want every, you know, and I'm thinking, well, your parents don't think you know about it. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, that was probably a good thing for her to be in a situation where she could talk about they it. See, and they see more bad stuff in five minutes on a phone. Exactly. Oh. They would ever see an answer. Actually, ac yeah. actually, that is very true. Well, my, my children or my twins are 42 with kids of their own, but when they were in the fourth or fifth grade, I had to sign, they were doing a sex act yeah. through me, and I, you know, and I was like, okay, you know, it's good, let the kids go, but I had to sign the paper yeah. Yeah. saying that they could do this, and I went up and talked to the PE teacher in the elementary school, and they said, would you believe we have two children that their parents did not sign the form, and there are our rowdiest kids, yeah. and they're the ones that are going to be. The in, parents are clueless. Yeah. Clue, and I'm like, they're going to be the ones we have trouble with. Yeah. And I said, you have got to be kidding. And I said, no. And then when I was in college, in a drama class, we were talking about growing up through school and all that, and they said, what's scary now, talking about life, is what we knew as seniors, a first, now I graduated in 81, a first grader knows what the class of 81 uh, knows. I don't, 
I pray it's not quite that young, but it could be. But with the ADI, it was just discussions of yeah. growing up and what's going on now. And so, yeah. so, you know, this is in the early 80s at Tarleton, and they were saying, and I was just kind of, do what? Yeah. It's gotten younger and younger for sure. I mean, a five or six year old can fix your iPad. Well, that's for you sure. Can. That's <laughs> right. Exactly. They can. <laughs> I call. Yeah. yeah, they know what to do. Well, and you know, the things they encounter, uh, it's a little bit off the topic, but the things they encounter, um, I have a friend and she has a son, and I think this happened when he was in ninth grade, maybe. And she said, um, he was not supposed to, oh, they had not let him do Instagram and all that stuff on his phone. And um, I can't remember exactly, but I think what had happened was he did do something. And she um, said one night, he just, she, he goes to the bathroom and he just comes out, he's just bawling. And he's like a ninth grade boy. And she said, what in the world is wrong with you? And he said, well, that he went on whatever it was and this supposed ninth grade girl responded to something he said and so then you know the story it goes and goes and then she wants him to send pictures of himself and he did and then it's <coughs> if you don't want these pictures to go to your whole yeah. uh, contact list you got to pay <coughs> and he just freaked out and so that's when he told told his parents and his mom said okay now just calm down you know we just got to figure out how we handle this and so I think she they did pay the it was like fifty dollars and then um, of course they come back and they want more money and so she called the police and they said do not send any more money they said that is not a ninth grader and that there are millions of people they'll do the same thing too, so they're not worried if you, you know, they are not likely to send that to the his whole contact list. And she went on, uh, I guess they sent the money by Zelle or something, and she looked, it was a 60-something year old man. And um, the thing about it is they were lucky because their son felt comfortable to confide in them. But a lot of kids encounter those kind of things and they are so ashamed. I mean, there have actually been kids that commit suicide because they think that that's what's going to happen okay. to them. And so you're right. And that's not something I ever had to deal I mean, my work, you know, never thought about anything like that. Well, and, it's interesting. I don't know if you've heard this on the news, but the people that actually design Instagram, Facebook, whatever, these video games and stuff, they don't let their kids get on the internet. It is so, I heard this and I was like, what? No, they may give them an hour a day or something, but they totally keep their children off all the social media. Yeah. You know, and you're like, well, that's how we pay our bills, that's how we do this, blah, blah, blah. But the people that have designed it, they've had stories and stories on the news that they don't let their kids on it. Yeah. And you're like, Wow. Yeah, it's it is a, definitely an issue and is a problem. Okay, back to the wounded healer. So um, it seems to me, and from what you've said as well, that it makes perfect sense that someone who has been wounded by life and has gone through pain is um, probably a, a good person to help another person along the way and to uh, stand with them and you know, walk with them through a difficult time. It's like grief uh, about anything and grief about a divorce or grief about whatever, but a uh, death and how, just like you said, Holly, somebody who can come along and they've been through it, it just really means a lot, uh, means a lot to you. And so um, that's like hospice, you know, often the volunteers that will go sit with people and stuff with hospice are people who've just gone through that experience and they have a person, had a person that died with hospice and so they then want to go and be a help to other people who are going through the same thing. And so um, I think that John Claypool is probably right. Henry Nowen was probably right. Uh, Henry Nowen um, 
he's written a lot of wonderful books, and I would encourage you if you uh, like to read, to read some of his books, but he struggled with deep, deep depression, and he just couldn't figure out why, you know, God wouldn't help him overcome it, because he just would go into these periods of, of deep depression, and he was, he was gay man, and of course he was a priest, and they don't like that too much in the Catholic Church. <laughs> I, hate tell, I hate to tell you, but uh, he um, and so he he struggled with a lot of things his his whole life, but was just has been profoundly helpful to people. <coughs> bless you, uh, to people going through things like that in their lives. And uh, for instance, John Claypool, the pastor, I was saying that said that he he lost his daughter. Um, uh, she was about eight, I think, and she died of leukemia. And, of course, that was a defining moment in his life, you know, that he then, and he wrote a book about it, and he, uh, they're offering you a tissue right there. Oh. And he um, wrote a book about it that helped a lot of people that they read. I still give that book to people that have had a loss uh, by and death. He came to Broadway right after. After that was, happened, yeah. After that happened. But he, he comes at it from, and he mentions this in talking about the wounded healer, he comes at it that we have to get to a place where we see all of life as a gift, that I don't deserve it. I mean, it's not like, you know, God gives us this gift of life and that we, um, it's not something we own or that we can hold on to, but it's just like when we lose somebody, what a gift your friend your friends were to you and you would have chosen to have them even if you knew that it wouldn't be a long time and so um, he talks about if we see it changes our whole perspective if we can see it as a gift and um, he told this story that was really interesting about this family had their fourth child and the doctor came out and said you know um, she's beautiful she's perfect in every way except she has no arms or legs. And this girl lived to be um, about 21, I think. And um, they said somebody, a friend came to visit and it was just like, I don't know how you do this, you know, how do you? And, and the girl said, um, I, I have gotten to enjoy the beauty of, you know, this family and, but thinking about it as a gift rather than, um, I'm holding on to it and it's mine and I don't want to lose it, you know. And um, so anyway, that's a really good little book. And uh, we, we have that book and we got several of them. I've given them to a friend that lost her husband. Yeah, it's still just as uh, helpful, I think, today as it was when he wrote it back in the 70s. And um, it's been reprinted and uh, yeah, I always keep two or three of them on hand to share them with people. And I think it's a hopeful, helpful way to look at, at loss. And so, um, anyway. All right. Huh? It's 9.36. It's 9.36. I know. I'm going to have to go. But, I just um, panicked because I, <laughs> <laughs> I just saw it. <laughs> oh, no. But we we'll have to tell you at 9.30. If, but um, I was just going to say, um, I think what the story of the Samaritan who helps the people um, can do is cause us to then think about our own willingness to help people and our own willingness to help people that we don't like and that we don't, you know, really love, but they're still God's children. And so that's kind of hospitality uh, that's been running through all the Sundays that we've talked about hospitality is uh, how do we then respond? It's real easy to offer hospitality to nice people and you know, it, it just isn't too hard, but there are difficult people that it's harder to, to be welcoming. And, and uh, so anyway, any questions about the Good Samaritan or thoughts? Well, I'm just thinking with what you said about, you know, I may not, you might help them and you may not like them, and you may end up becoming friends. That's true. That's true. It's a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there's a really good movie 
Um, I don't know if it got much claim when it first came out, but it's called The Best of Enemies. And it's a story about, it's a true story. Have you ever seen it? I think so. Yeah, it's about this black woman who's an activist in her little town in South Carolina, North Carolina, somewhere there. And then the guy that's the head of the Ku Klux Klan and how they become friends. Huh. And um, it is, uh, it's really, it's a very powerful story. And uh, so I just one day was, I don't know, it was on a Saturday or something. I was doing something and I'm flipping through and saw it and it's, uh, it's a good one. By the way, just we've got some brochures today for the Real Religion that's going to be next weekend and um, some really good movies. And you can watch, pick, I think there's six or seven on Friday night, Saturday morning, and Saturday afternoon. They're not repeated. I mean, they're all different. So you could go to... Are you speaking at one? I am on Friday night. Mine is Father Stu with Mark Wahlberg. And David's so, doing one. David's yeah, David's doing one. And he's doing and doing and doing Driving Miss Daisy. Yeah. Driving Miss Daisy. Uh, David was in Driving Miss Daisy <laughs> in the local theater, and uh, he was really good. So, uh, uh, yes, he's doing one. Carol's doing one. I think hers is on Saturday yeah. at some time. And um, she's doing the Pray Away the one about the reparative therapy that we we previewed over before, but uh, but that's the one she's, I think, discussing. And so um, so there's some good ones. And and there's lunch, too. There's yeah, lunch on Saturday. If you do. And you can go online and register for lunch. So let's say prayer. God, we pray that you will um, give us openness to the questions. There's so many of them and so many things we don't understand. But we thank you that you are big enough and that you're willing to uh, listen to us when we have doubts and questions and we don't understand. I thank you for these friends who have uh, come in the cold to be here today. And we pray that you'll be with us now as we go to worship. Amen. <laughs>